Hi, it is your Reverend Dr. Nadine Rosechild Sullivan reading to you from my book, I Trusted You Fully and Honestly Speaking of Gendered Assault. I'm going to be reading a section, a short section called The Globe versus the United States that begins on page 19. I'm going to pause here for a moment to give a trigger warning. I will be mentioning um, horrors that are done to women and girls for being women and girls and by women and girls that also includes um, my, you know, but it would also include those who are gender nonconforming and transgender women, and at some level, trans men, um, because gender nonconformity just puts one at risk in many, many ways. But it also distinctly includes cisgender women and girls. Being assigned female at birth is not a category that adds to one's safety in general. So there's a trigger warning here for the knowledge that is forthcoming. However, as I've said in another video, I believe it is extremely important for us to speak about these things in order to be able to fight them, to change them. We are a thinking species. We can change how we do gender and how we interact around gender. And the uh, Geneva Overholzer quote on which the subtitle of the book is based is, as long as rape is deemed unspeakable, and that would go for all forms of violence against people on grounds of gender, as long as rape is deemed unspeakable and is therefore not fully and honestly spoken of, the public outrage will be muted as well. So trigger warning, my apologies to anyone who has experienced gendered violence of any kind. Um, on the other hand, it must be talked about, we, it must be dealt with, we must collectively organize in order to change this and continue to change this. And the changes that have been brought about for this in the United States have been brought about by the courageous survivors who stepped forward and told their stories. And so I try to do that myself in this book, but I also bring forward the stories of collectivities of survivors, and I also bring forward the truth of the facts sociologically. And so there's there's no way to sugarcoat this story or what happens in regard to this. So there's your trigger warning and now we go on. So page 19, the globe versus the United States, the globe. Teaching gender and sexuality, I'm continually aware that women around the world face a host of horrors for being women and girls. Two waves of women's activism from 1848 to 1920 and from 1963 until the present have made continual improvements in the status of women in the United States. In other geographic and cultural settings, women may be killed, honor killing, by their family members, which is really an oxymoron, right? Killing someone, on, honorably killing, killing, killing for honor killing for their family's honor. So in other geographic and cultural settings, women may be killed, honor killing by their family members for perceived violations of their family's honor, for being found to have a broken hymen, for getting pregnant outside of marriage, for marrying outside of culture, religion, tribe, or even for falling victim to rape. I would extend that again to include gender nonconforming people, and I would extend that to include um, Oftentimes, people of alternative sexual orientations, I am aware that honor killing is a practice often against young boys perceived to be gay. In some settings, women may be burned to death by their husband or mother-in-law so that their husband or his family may receive a new dowry because heard by her death, he is again made sig single and available for another marriage. In India, over 8,000 women per year are burned in dowry deaths, 22 per day in 2007. The most common form of violence experienced by women globally is physical violence inflicted by, a, by an intimate partner, otherwise sometimes misnamed domestic violence, but forms of interpersonal violence. On average, at least one in three women is beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused by an intimate partner in the course of her lifetime. Also, it is estimated that worldwide, one in five women will become a victim of rape or attempted rape in her lifetime. And according to World Bank data, women between ages 15 to 44 are more at risk from rape and domestic violence than from cancer, motor accidents, war, and malaria. Further, according to the World Health Organization, several global surveys suggest that half of all women, depending on location, 40 to 70%, who die from homicide are killed by their current or former husbands or male partners. Around the globe, women are forced to work in sweatshops for pennies a day, or forced by economics to migrate to seek domestic labor far from their homes and children. 
60 million girls worldwide have been forced, given or sold into arranged marriages as children, being given into marriage so young that they face increased and inordinate risk during labor and childbirth, including dramatically increased rates of infant and maternal mortality and obstetrical fistula. Not including other forms of prostitution, a conservative estimate indicates that at least 3 million women and girls and a very small number of boys worldwide have been kidnapped, deceived, or sold by their families and trafficked as slaves, in effect, the property of another who could be killed by their owner with impunity, for sex work in brothels, even servicing, often servicing 17 or more men per day with no respite, not even after a birth or an abortion, unless they die, still often children and or teens of HIV AIDS. And in many places, millions of girls between their toddler and teen year, years, generally without anesthesia or antiseptic, have their genitals permanently mutilated, their clitorises removed, their labia removed, and sometimes also their vaginas sewn shut in the practice of female genital mutilation. Now I'm reading a poem that is on page 21, and um, it is entitled, it is a, a poem of solidarity, and it is entitled, I Am the Japanese Picture Bride. I am the Japanese picture bride given in marriage to a stranger. I am the five-year-old girl bleeding anguish as her genitals are cut away. I am the 12-year-old pregnant by her father, stu too stunned for weeping, too numb to tell. I am the disappointed wife at 40, blessing herself she only has two to feed as she throws husband out the door. I am the immolated bride in India, ashes melted at husband's mother's request, the smoke of all rejection. I am the 10-year-old giving birth all week till genitals rip and fistula makes a leper. I am the disenfranchised worker, chipping fingers 18 hours a day, back hunched, eyes dimming, stitching designer labels for 80 cents. I am the sex worker on her knees, head pushed down on penis, or thigh spread riding out its thrusts. These, all these, live inside me, breathe my air, digest my meat. All these become me. Page 24, the United States. By comparison, the lives of women in North America seem sweet. And as, when assigned a paper on the status of women in the, in the United States, most undergraduates I have known over the past decade and a half have written glowing reports pro proclaiming mainstream American women's successful and complete emancipation. The overriding thesis of these papers is that here, in regard to gender, it is now all better. And yet, the lives of women here are still complicated by the ongoing legacy of gender discrimination and a range of issues that are simply not actually all better yet. It is true that here and now, because of women's movements, mainstream, native-born American women have relative freedom to pursue their own happiness, particularly if they happen to be white. Prior to the first wave of the women's movement, women were perpetual minors by law, even white women, were perpetual minors by law. The legal property of either a father or a husband, or the wards of their nearest male relative. Subsumed into father-husband's identity, they had no rights to own property, to sue or be sued, to serve on a jury, or to be tried by a jury of their female peers. No matter how ill or how tired or how pregnant or how postpartum or how menstrual or how menopausal, a woman had no right to say no to sex in marriage or no to a husband's request for her domestic service. She was considered to have given him perpetual permission on the altar when she said, I do. If a woman took off time to care for extended family members, even her own aging parents, her husband could sue the estates of his in-laws for remuneration for the wifely services lost to him during that time. That included sex. In widowhood and housekeeping, in widowhood or divorce, a woman had no right to custody of the children to whom she had given birth and that she had been raising. 
If she fled an unhappy or abusive marriage, her husband could advertise for her return and the return of his children in the same way that an owner could advertise for the return of a runaway slave or indentured servant. Oh, and because they had no legal standing as citizens, no woman of any race or socioeconomic stat status could vote. The first wave of women's activism won women the right to own property, the right to enter into contracts and to legally dissolve them, including the right to sue for divorce, the right to consideration in child custody disputes, and the right to vote. Women also began to press into the workplace and in small numbers into the professions. Because of the second strong wave of women's activism, which was the 1960s and 70s mostly, women gained, gained reproductive rights, including contraception and the legal recognition of the right to say no to sex within a marriage, the right to her own body. It also should be noted that contraception in the form of hormonal birth control was not created until 1960, not legal for all women in the United States until 1965. So I'm going to repeat that other sentence. Because of the second strong wave of women's activism, women gained reproductive rights, including contraception and the legal right, rec in the legal recognition of a right to say no to sex within a marriage, the right to her own body. They also made a mass entrance into college, the workforce, and the professions but an invisible glass ceiling remains, restricting how high the mass of women rise within institutional and career settings and contributing to an ongoing and significant gender wage gap. And the legacy of gender ideology continues to affect the ways we share housework, household work and childcare, and even more the ways we interact in interpersonal relationships, most especially heterosexual ones. 40 years after the second wave of women's activism, sexual violation and intimate partner assault remain overwhelming and concrete realities for millions of women in the United States today. So I'm going to pause there with the note that while women have mostly pressed in to education and into the workforce, while most women are working, even mothers of young children, um, there are still overwhelming class distinctions in who gets to have a career in which they find fulfillment versus those who are working for subsistence wages. There are ongoing class issues in the United States. And the last I heard, approximately 60% of the American workforce was not earning a living wage, and that would include males and females. Um, that was before the pandemic of 20, um, well, the pandemic named for 2019, COVID-19, and uh, the pandemic that is playing out here in 2020, and we will see where it takes us. It was before um, this staff that I'm quoting of 60% not making a living wage um, was actually true before the Great Recession of 2007, 8, 9, and 10, because that was a very definitively multi-year uh, Great Recession and before whatever the pandemic is going to do to our economy now and going forward. So uh, we'll see where the stats are when the dust settles 10 years from now um, in 2030. But for now, let it suffice to say that many, many, many work American workers are not working um, in fulfilling careers and are not making a living wage. And that includes females and males. But there is nonetheless a lifelong gender wage gap. That gender wage gap is um, specifically higher. Uh, so it is higher for women of color and lower for white women. But um, much of the increase, even for the stats for all women or for white women, we appear to have gained in um, our gender difference from males, going from 60 some cents on the male dollar, going even from 50 some cents on the male dollar in the mid 20th century to 77, 78, 80 cents on the male dollar, depending on which year and who you're listening to um, right now. But the fact that there's now about a 20 cent difference between the white female wage and the white male wage or between all men and all women in the wage gap um, is due to the fact that males' wages have been dropping more than that women's wages have been going up. And there remain distinct differences for those who are African-American and those who are Latina in the United States. So um, that being said, 
most of us aren't doing what we'd love to do. I thankfully love what I'm doing and I'm very blessed and grateful for that, but that has not been true always and um, and not certainly not been true in a living wage sense across my lifespan. And so I know the other side as well. Um, so I will let this go for the moment, but it is important to remember that, um, that the United States, the women in the United States have been fighting a fight since 1848 um, for their rights and for equality and equity with men that within that intersectionally differently raced and ethnic differently ethnicized different ethnicities of women and uh, different so religious backgrounds and socioeconomic class backgrounds all of that there has been a continual ongoing fight for our rights for our equality this also includes um, transgender women who often have great difficulties with employment after transition um, because we are an unforgiving culture at present. But remember, I am arguing we are a thinking species. We can change how we do gender. We can change how we do equality. We can change how we treat each other on grounds of gender race, ethnicity, national origin, uh, documented and undocumented class statuses, gender identity and performance, and uh, sexual orientation and ability of body and mind. We can change all of these things and begin to treat each other with mutual human respect. That said, the battle goes on in other countries, the women of those countries uh, leading their battle for rights and equity in all sorts of levels and ways, intersectional ways. And so we stand with them in solidarity. And as a US born American uh, believer in women's rights, I fight here. So, and I stand in solidarity with all who fight everywhere. So see you next reading. And we will pick up again with I Trusted You, Fully and Honestly Speaking, A Gendered Assault. <laughs>